All right, let me check, check. Does that work in the back? Can you hear me? Uh, I guess that's not going in the back pocket. Um, let's try the front pocket, let's see how that works. Cool, so this is a talk about Docker. Um, if you're not expecting a talk about Docker, you're probably in the wrong room. Just, just a real quick note there. Uh, my name's Mark Allen, I'm gonna talk to you about Docker. Um, how many of you know what Docker is or have heard of it or are curious about it? Cool. Um, hopefully this is going to be, so this is, I only have 20 minutes to talk to you about this, so this is going to be a pretty brief introduction um, to the subject. I could, honestly, I, you probably don't want to, but I, I could spend three hours on this if you want, um, but of course you don't want me to, so that's cool. Um, uh, if you do, then find me in the hallway, and, and we'll do that um, if you want, but you probably don't, so it's fine. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about dockerizing all the things, um, specifically with a pearl bent uh, today, uh, one of the things that I was hoping that I could do for you uh, was to do a live demo of building a Docker. Um, apparently, that's not going to really work out too good because of the network congestion that we have. Um, so I have uh, I started building a Docker container. Um, oh, probably about 9:30, and it's maybe 40 or 50 percent done uh, right now. So it, we're not going to get a demo in. Uh, unfortunately, sorry. Um, if you want to see a demo, like come find me, and I'll and I'll do. I'll be happy to show you um, once it gets built. Um, but anyway, uh, let's talk about what Docker is, in case anyone doesn't know. Um, Docker is a lightweight virtualization platform. Um, you can think of it as kind of a a way for a, a bunch of different isolated environments to share the same kernel of an operating system. So in this case, the operating system would be Linux. Um, the Docker project has as its plan to abstract over many other operating systems, including FreeBSD and Solaris, uh, potentially even Mac OS X. It's not really super clear yet what the total roadmap is. Um, Docker just had a big um, convention in San Francisco about two weeks ago, and they made a ton of new announcements. So I've updated my slides uh, to account for the new information, and we'll quickly go over what some of the big uh, announcements were. Um, probably the biggest thing that was announced in San Francisco last week, or two weeks ago, was that Docker uh, hit the 1.0 milestone, um, and the company feels good about putting it in production. Now, a lot of people, a lot of companies have been running Dockers um, in production for a long time. Um, but now Docker is saying that you know it's official and it's baked and you can go ahead and do it and um, there's you know a company standing behind it at this point. So um, Docker is lightweight um, and it simplifies deploying applications. The reason it simplifies those things is because what it does is it provides a completely isolated environment. So one of the things that has been really popular in Perl community lately is things like Pinto, Stratopan, Carton. These are things that let you vendor your dependencies. So for example, you won't be bitten by the thing where you want to deploy your application into an environment and all of a sudden all the stuff that comes down from CPAN breaks your code. Um, what you get with Docker is a stable build all the time and since it's basically a frozen um, carbonite image of your application and all of its dependencies, it's the same no matter where it gets deployed. So you can deploy it into test in the same way, you can deploy it into stage in the same way, you can deploy it into production in the same way, and it all uses the same exact container. Um, so I like to think of it as a cargo container because you don't really care about what goes in a cargo container. It could be coffee beans, it could be toasters, it could be Pop-Tarts, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can think of Docker as like um, a cargo container for your code. So in the same way, you could have a web application in there, you could have LDAP service, you could have an email server. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that you can stuff into a Docker and then deploy it across all these environments in a consistent way. So that's sort of the basic premise of what Docker, Docker gives you. Um, Docker's written in Go. Um, Go is really fun. If you haven't played with Go and you want to contribute to Docker, um, it's a great project to kind of get your feet wet. They have a whole GitHub repo um, full of issues that are marked easy fix. Um, those are things that people that are novices to Go can easily pick off and, and um, contribute to. Um, one of the other things that's changed uh, from sort of Docker 0.5, which is where I started contributing, to now is that they've moved from LXC and AUFS, which are two sort of very Linux specific um, technologies, to libcontainer, which is sort of a generic version of LXC. Um, again, because they want to port it to multiple platforms. Uh, and a union file system, which is actually implemented as a dev mapper. Um, so on Unixes or Linuxes that don't support AUFS, which is like this wonky union file system that's officially deprecated and not supported and all this bad stuff, they've moved to a, an environment where you can map new file system layers um, into a device. And so that's how they do support for things like Fedora and Red Hat um, Enterprise Linux um, and other things that don't support AUFS. For a long time, 
Uh, Ubuntu was really the only distribution that supported Docker sort of natively because they had AUFS in their kernel. Um, but uh, the good news about Docker is that basically the virtualization overhead of a container is very small. It's, it's effectively zero. Um, it's almost native speed, um, and because it shares the same kernel, uh, there's not sort of the high cost of uh, emulating device drivers, um, you know, and, me and memory management and all the other things that uh, a VM, which is heavyweight, has to do for you. Uh, Dockers also start very fast, so a VM might take a minute to boot. A Docker takes, you know, I don't know, 500 microseconds or a, a second to start up. And once it's started, you know, it's ready to rock. It's ready to accept requests and start servicing uh, things from the environment. Um, and it's also completely isolated. I can't stress that enough. Um, it's really, really important and it's a key feature of the, of the product. Um, this is a quick diagram that I basically stole from docker.io, which is their main website. Um, so over here you have this Docker client. Um, and when we, so let me back up a step. Uh, the Docker project is one monolithic project. So if you go to GitHub and you clone it, you're gonna get a source repo that contains all this stuff. Um, it contains the daemon and it contains the client. So the client is what the command line application. So when you type docker do stuff, you know, minus i and all this other um, command line flag stuff, you're actually using the docker client. Um, under the hood, the, the client is actually sending um, uh, rest requests to the docker daemon, which is running on a host, which may or may not be the same system where you're running the client. So for example, you could have a whole farm of docker hosts over here um, and one docker client that actually manages all of them. Um, and because this is a REST API, you actually don't need to use the Docker client to do all this stuff. You can actually implement clients in whatever language you want. Um, as far as I know, there's not a Perl one, um, but there could be. So if you're really interested in this, you could write one for Perl. Um, and then finally down here, we have this index. This index thing is kind of the CPAN of Docker images. Um, that's, uh, there's a, I think at last count, there's like 20,000 images. And the images are basically pre-baked Docker uh, containers that have a certain baseline. So for example, there's um, containers for all the major Linux distributions. There's one for Fedora, there's one for CentOS, there's one for Ubuntu. Um, and those are sort of you know, blank slates. You can put in whatever you want inside of those things. Um, but there's also applications. So for example, they have Nginx, they have um, LDAP services, they have uh, MySQL, they have Postgres, they have a whole bunch of databases, um, including like React. Uh, you know, some really serious heavy duty um, services that are already prepackaged for you so you don't have to go through and figure out how to containerize them. They're already just waiting there for you. Um, let's uh, talk about why. So why would you want to use Docker? Well, I've already tried to convince you that it's a good idea. Um, here are some other reasons that I think it's really cool. Um, I like to think of Docker as kind of Git for file systems. Uh, the reason is because Docker actually builds layers of changes. So um, in a few slides, I'm going to show you a Docker file. And every time a Docker file executes an instruction, it actually writes a unique layer um, into the file system. And then what it does is it unions all of those things into a coherent file system. So what that means is, is that you can start at a baseline um, and you can easily revert things back to, um, you can basically go backwards in time. So if you decide that, you know, uh, the dependency that you deployed wasn't a good one or was broken, you can actually remove that layer from your image and replace it with a new layer, and then um, you don't have to redo all the work that you did previously. So you, um, it basically caches the work that you do to uh, build a container image, which is really neat. Um, there's also a bunch of third-party um, uh, services that help you deploy containers into environments, um, and those are either homegrown or there's a whole bunch that are open source. Um, and it's, it's really neat. Um, it's also really fun. And um, I know it's a bullet point, but you'll just have to take my word for it. Because um, everything that's a bullet point is true. Uh, so this is the new hotness. This is, um, this is what Docker, uh, the company, um, Docker LLC or whatever they are, uh, just released um, or talked about in San Francisco. This was their big announcement. Um, they're uh, releasing a lib container as open source. Uh, it's also written in Go. Um, they, as I mentioned there, they want to make it platform independent. Um, there's also a communications channel called libchan. 
uh, which Im implements Go style communication pathways. Um, it's also open source, it's implemented in Go. Um, but it is really cool because it implements a whole bunch of different ways to communicate between two different systems. Um, those can include uh, HTTP transport, um, native RPC, like uh, you know binary protocol. Um, you can also do IPC, like uh, if you're on the same server, you can do shared memory or socket, uh, Unix socket communications. Um, and it just sort of abstracts away all of those details from you. You don't really need to care about it. All you need to know is, I want to send this message over to this other thing, and it will do its best to deliver it to that other thing. Um, and then you can get it replies back, and, and um, it's just really neat. Uh, and then finally, there's this thing called libswarm. And um, libswarm is this idea that uh, you want to basically be able to construct networks of Docker containers, but you need some way to manage them and hook them all together. And that's what this uh, idea is. So it's not actually an application per se, but it's a toolkit that lets you build applications that interface Docker with a whole bunch of other services. Some of those services include these. Um, CoreOS. Um, CoreOS is a Linux distribution which uh, is completely based around Docker deployment. It is really, really cool. Um, its uh, images are available on AWS if you want to play around with it. You can also download um, ISOs and put them in VirtualBox and stuff like that. Uh, it's really neat. They have a, uh, a consistent um, key value store called etcd, which they released about six months ago. Uh, it's also written in Go. You might notice a theme here. Um, and uh, it, uh, what it does is it persistently stores key values across uh, multiple distributed nodes and maintains the, um, the consistency of all the keys and the values, um, even in the face of failures. So it's really neat, um, and it interfaces with Docker pretty nicely. There's a project called SkyDoc, which is um, this project that uh, was called SkyDNS. And what SkyDoc does is every time a Docker spins up, uh, a container starts, it actually registers itself uh, with SkyDoc, which is a DNS server. And then if you want to address your containers using DNS, like you want to do load balancing using DNS, or you just want to reference them without having to type in the IP address in a port or whatever, um, you can use Sky DNA, uh, SkyDoc as a discovery service as well as a routing service for your requests. So it's really neat. Um, there's a, a, a private uh, platform as a service called Deus. Um, it's implemented in, in uh, Django and also Go. Um, and uh, it's really neat. Um, it allows you to do sort of Heroku style push um, deployments using Docker. So you would push your application to Deus and Deus would actually build a, a container if it doesn't already have one. And then it would go ahead and deploy it wherever you tell it to. So if you say, I want to deploy um, you know, this application into staging, it would go ahead and build that container if it didn't, if it didn't have it and then it would push it out um, across, uh, across your network to whatever servers you said were staging servers. Um, Flynn, same idea, a different implementation. There's one called Daku, which is actually really, really uh, interesting. It's a, um, it's a platform as a service implementation in Bash. Um, yeah, and uh, it also uses Docker. Um, it's not quite as slick as the other two that I mentioned, um, but it is really interesting. And um, if you, uh, you want to see some like crazy ingy level like Bash hacking, then you want to check out Daku. Um, and then finally, the last thing is console. Um, console is a service discovery uh, service, which is a little weird to say. Um, and it uses this um, gossip protocol called Surf uh, under the hood to uh, maintain um, consistency among the nodes. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, it just came out, I think it's only like two months old. And um, it's also by HashiCorp, the people that do Vagrant and, uh, and Packer. Um, and this is kind of their answer to how do we manage Docker infrastructure. Um, you obviously can manage not Docker infrastructure with this too. So um, if you have a bunch of services in your network and you're interested in how can I manage them, you might want to check out Console. Um, it's written in Go. Uh, and then let's see. Uh, before I move to the next slide, are there any? Yeah, go ahead. Question. Yes, you, you, you can use it for, for whatever you want, to be honest. You, you could package internal you know, uh, business line of business apps, or you can package uh, internet-facing services like mail service or LDAP or whatever. So whatever you want to deploy in your environment, you could use Docker to do that if you want. Yeah, so... Can you give more particular examples of 
Yeah, so um, actually the next slide is um, just kind of showing a Docker file. Um, so maybe this will help sort of uh, illuminate how you might build a container. Um, so what this actually is, is um, the, the recipe for building uh, an application. Um, in this case, it's a web application. And what you do is you curl a Perl um, a Mojo, a Mojo Lite application, um, a dice specification, because um, I'm a big nerd. So uh, you, you curl it a dice specification like 3D6 plus 1. And it will go ahead and roll 3D6 plus 1 and then return that to you in, in the return uh, value from that. Um, and so what I did here is I um, wrote my application. Um, I stuck it up in a gist. And um, I'm installing all the prerequisites for it because I'm using this Fedora, Fedora base container. So this is basically just base Fedora. Um, that's all it has is like the minimum set of stuff that Fedora comes with. So it's a kernel, essentially, and glibc, and the linker, and that's about it. Um, so then I'm installing all of these things. I'm installing Perl Modulicious, which includes Perl as a dependency. Um, so Perl gets installed. I'm installing cpn minus. I'm installing games dice, which is the dice uh, module I've chosen to use uh, for my, for my uh, application. And I'm using cpan minus to install it. And every time one of these lines executes, there's a new layer that gets created. So let's say that cpan minus fails to install. Right? So then all I've gotten done here is I started with Fedora. I did the maintainer, which actually writes a layer. And then I have this thing. So Mojolicious got installed, but cpan minus did not get installed. Now Mojo has 41 megabytes of dependencies. And if you're on this Wi-Fi, you don't want to reinstall 41 megabytes of dependencies. So, so this will actually be cached in the, in the Docker layer. And then the next time I try to build this thing, it's going to start right here. It's going to look at all the stuff and say, this didn't change, this didn't change, this didn't change. OK, I haven't done this yet. I'm going to do that right now. And then after it does that, it's going to go through the rest of the recipe and complete it. Um, so we'll do games dice. We'll install git. We'll do git clone. We'll cd into our directory here. And then we'll start Mor Morbo, which is the built-in Mojo web server. And then we'll expose this port, 3000, which is the default, um, the default port. Now. Um, when you uh, expose a port, what you're saying to Docker is, is that I want you to map some random port on your server, the external server, the host server, to this Docker container so that I can service web requests with it. Um, you will not necessarily know in advance what that port is, um, but you can, ask, you can interrogate Docker and ask it what port it's running on, and it will tell you. Um, there's a PS command for Docker that shows you all of the running containers and what ports are exposed and what they're mapped into. Um, so. That's kind of a, uh, an overview of how you would construct a container. Um, and uh, are there any questions about any of this? Yeah. I thought you mentioned that uh, the sharing, they're still sharing the same kernel. Mm -hmm. these images. Yeah. So by installing Fedora, you're just installing um, the file system part? Yeah, so I'm just installing. Yeah, so I, it's basically the sort of the guts of a Fedora image. Um, it doesn't include the. the um, it's not bootable, you know, but it does include all of the file system parts of it and all of the binary parts of it. It's, it's the base, the smallest minimum possible Fedora image, basically, that, that you can have. And is that stuff necessary, or would it fall back to the native system? At that no, you, you, you have to start with a base container of some kind. So, yeah. So are these containers like uh, BSD jails? Yeah, in a, in, a, in a sense, they are just like BSD jails. Um, in another sense, they're not just like BSD jails. And the difference is really in the file system part. So the, the isolation part you, you can achieve right now with things like jails, uh, things like LXC, stuff like that. It's already existed for a long time. The part that's sort of innovative and new about Docker is the fact that when you execute these instructions, they write all of these file system layers out to disk. So that's the part that's kind of new. And they get their own IP address? The, they, they actually share an IP. So usually what you do is you, uh, you use the host IP and they're assigned a port. So each service gets a port assignment. You can give them IPs if you really want to. Yes, and yes. Uh, the, an audience member noticed you can uh, assign IPs if you want. Yeah, another question. And you get slash temp as well? Um, you can mount file systems that are shared between the host and the demons, the, the container, if you want. So that would be the shared temp. It would be a shared file system layer, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the question was, can they share an, a, a common resource on the host? The answer is yes, they can. Um, so having run through all of that, basically uh, what you could do is, is uh, do this uh, on your own if you like. And the way you would do that is this. Um, once you get it all set up, you can actually do curl, um, localhost, and then whatever the assigned port is, and it will go ahead and tell you. Um, 
Some um, important stuff that you might want to find out more about is docker.io. That's the main website. Um, there's really, really nice tutorials there, um, including getting started, how to install it. Uh, one thing that's also really new, um, since I'm running out of time, uh, I'll try to leave a few minutes for questions at the end. But one thing that's really new is this thing called boot to Docker, which um, if you're running uh, OS 10, you can actually uh, run the Docker client locally on your Mac, and you can have a virtualized um, Vagrant style um, Docker host that you can actually deploy containers onto. So while you're testing and developing and doing stuff like that, um, you can actually uh, build um, containers on OS 10 and then deploy them into your, your virtualized Docker host, which is really cool. Um, so uh, yeah, so index.docker.io is the CPAN. There, seriously, there's like 20,000 images that are just available. Um, now, of course, you probably should, you know, caveat mTOR, right? Like you need to inspect them and make sure that they're not like, have backdoors and do bad things to you. Um, but, uh, but there are lots of lots of lots of pre-done images uh, available out there, so it might save you some time. Um, I would say trust images that come from Docker directly. Uh, anything else you probably want to be skeptical of, at least, um, until you uh, do some battle testing with it. Um, and then finally, the, the project is on GitHub. It's open source. It's uh, doc .cloud, although I think now it's Docker Docker. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's it. Um, thank you. Uh, are there any questions that I can, yeah, right in the front. Um, so how do you, uh, I would want to ship my own Perl. Yeah. Um, how do you approach that? Um, well, I mean, it, it sort of depends uh, on the context of how you package your Perl for, di for di distribution. Um, if you build like a, a Linux style RPM or a deb or something, then you could just point the Docker file let me go back to the Docker file. You could just point the Docker file to install it right here, right? Like you could say yum install minus y, whatever you're, right? You could have a, a re you could have a repo definition above this where you write it into uh, etsy yumd and then say deploy the deploy my Perl, you know, whatever dot rpm, and it would install it. Sure. Yeah, you absolutely can run Perl. You can anything that you can do in a Bash script, you can do in a Docker file. Um, so. Okay. Built with Plim. Okay. So you can get like, I think it starts with 5.8, maybe even 5.6, and you can get all the way up to 5.20. Okay, so so there was a comment that you can, on uh, index.docker.io, you can get um, all major versions of Perl pre installed available. Yes, question. Are there any workloads that you wouldn't want to put inside Docker? Maybe like a firewall or anything? Um, I think, yeah, I think, I think there's some that you maybe not, you know, wouldn't want to have on there. Um, but to be honest, uh, th there's not much that I wouldn't consider putting in Docker. Um, depending on the needs of your firewall and like how much traffic you're doing, you're, you're not that far above, you know, the OS layer, right? So um, as long as you're running sufficiently large enough VM or bare metal or whatever to handle the load, there's no reason not to containerize it because the overhead of, con of containerization is so minimal. Um, so it's really worth considering. Yeah. It says doc, you have Docker execute things on remote machines, does it have interface for it, Yes, yes and no. Um, as I said, so so if I go back to the diagram here just really quickly, um, you have the client and it and it can manage all of the different containers on a different host. So so in that sense, yes, it can do things to remote systems, but it's not like SSH or anything. Yeah, way in the back. Um, Yes. Yes, you so can. It, is, it essentially virtualizes the bare metal underneath it. 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 What I would say is it virtualizes the kernel that you have running out there for Linux, and so it lets you share resources on one single operating system image, right? So if you have a VM that's pretty beefy, you can install, you know, tens, twenties, thirties of Dockers with with no problem at all. Um, yeah, it's really really cool. You could. Nope. Or KVM or any of that other no, no. All, all you need is the Docker, Docker daemon, uh, and then the containers, and then how you want to manage them, right? If you have thirty, if you have thirty containers running out on a host, uh, that's going to be hard to keep track of if you deploy that a lot in your environment. So, um, I know people like think VM sprawl is horrible. Well, you know, <laughs> wait till everything's containerized. Uh, then you're really going to have a, a management problem. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. Are there any other questions? Uh, how do you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's a that's a great question. Um, 
Let me, let me quickly go back to the Docker file. Um, one of the things that you can do in here is you can specify connections to other Dockers. Um, so you can actually plumb the connections between Docker containers by using Docker file commands. Well, it's kind of a snapshot, right? So once you build a file system layer, it's like whatever the Git was at that day or when you built the container. So it's, it's carbonite frozen. It's like you put Han into the machine and he comes out and he's frozen and he's just gonna stay that way. Um, and it's gonna be like that f until you change it, right? So, yeah. So if like, your host system is Ubuntu and you put on a uh, container, yeah. you have processes to both of them running at the same time on one machine? Yes. If you want, if it's really, it's really a shared OS layer. So yes, you're sharing a kernel at sort of the base level, like for networking and for memory management and stuff like that. But everything else is completely contained inside the Docker. Okay, I'm out of time. I wish I could talk to you guys more about this. It's really cool. Uh, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it.